Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here in Glasgow um, and to spend a few wonderful positive hours uh, in a Brexit-free talk zone. <laughs> because the reality is this demonstrates the sheer power of civil society in Scotland. And I want to talk a little bit about something very, very important to me. Next month, we'll see two important reports being published about the UK's failure to build sustainable peace in Iraq and in Libya. And I want to say a few words about how they could do it better. For if my experiences in Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya has taught me anything, it is that hard power by itself cannot transform societies and that we need a full-spectrum approach to conflict resolution that harnesses the power of civil society, cultural diplomacy, and small nations like Scotland, and, of course, you, the energy of people like Laura and perhaps even Ellis Watson. Now, I realize that for some, this may be an unwelcome contribution for those that see states' role as to monopolize diplomatic power rather than share it. But we have seen how, since 9-11, there has been a failure to quell terrorism or to predict the advent of the Arab Spring, the rise of ISIS, or indeed the crisis in Ukraine. And this raises fundamental questions about our ability to spot and deal with conflict in the 21st century. Failures which have now rocked the very foundation of Europe as little children get washed up upon its shores. So I say the time has come to re-examine some of the more outdated 20th century concepts of diplomacy and entitlement that often frame stabilization efforts, where government officials talk to other government officials or to stabilization experts in surreal green zones without the very people they're stabilizing, where other men and women are sent out from military forward bases in your name to police communities they know very little about. So we must be clear about what we are facing here. We are facing conflicts which are no longer interstate in nature. They involve an array of non-state actors, often sponsored by shadowy forces, who pay no regard to territorial boundaries, do not respect the sovereign rights of states, or the law of armed conflict. For today, we, you, live in a 9-11 world beset by disruption in which the distinctions between foreign policy and domestic policy, between hard power and soft power, between non-state mediators and state mediators are disappearing fast. This is the world in which we now live, to hear square, the rise of ISIS, it is a disruptive world. So what does disruption mean to me? It denotes a state of uncertainty which calls for resolution, but where the status quo is no option. It is a life force that animates the human condition, but which can be overcome by human agency and ingenuity. It is a world, in a sense, that I have been inured in whether as an advocate before the European Court of Human Rights in conflict zones in the War of Terror or in UN multilateral diplomacy in the Grand Palais. But throughout all those experiences, one thing has shone brighter than anything else, and that is the contribution 
of civil society. So let me just share four stories about civil society. The first concerns Southeast Turkey in the early 1990s. Uh, I came across this village, which was just populated by women and children because the menfolk had fled as a result of the conflict with the PKK. It had been burnt uh, and brutally persecuted. I remember one woman coming to me and saying, it's a miracle you've come. Tell the world what happened. It was a pitiful moment of despair. But yet two years later, I saw her and the wizened old man that was left in the village walk into a marble hall in Ankara to give evidence before the European Commission on Human Rights about a son that was killed, a village that was destroyed, and a culture that was suppressed. This because Turkish and British lawyers came together to form the Kurdish Human Rights Project and file over 400 cases. But trying to tell displaced peasants that they should believe in some system of law in a distant place as opposed to the gun was in a sense counterproductive, but in law they chose. And as a result, compensation was paid, state security courts were reformed, detention times were brought down, Kurdish language restrictions were lifted, and the death penalty was abolished, all under a new AKP government in Turkey. It demonstrated to me what can happen when civil societies across different worlds come together uh, and, and apply disruptive thinking. The second image I want to share with you is of Damascus in 2006 and of young Syrian artists showing Delfina Entrecanales, an 80-year-old patron of the arts, their work, after I invited her to tour the region in an attempt to try and mitigate the more polarizing elements of the war on terror, Abu Ghraib, a war in terror in which Arabs were quickly demonized and dialogue between radical groups and states were banished in favor of a hard power solution. The result was the Delfina Foundation in which she gave hundreds of artists residency places. It, to me, encapsulates disruptive thinking of an 80-year-old's curiosity and willingness to travel beyond accepted paradigms to create a vital lifeline between two different cultures at a moment of supreme alienation. Now, some say the failure after 9-11 of state-driven diplomacy to reach out to marginal groups is one of the gravest failures of conventional diplomacy in this century. But fortunately, there are a number of non-state mediators that emerged to fill the gap, one of which I work for, called the Center of Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva. It, through working with groups that were often considered beyond the pale, helped to bring peace in Aceh. This is a picture of a peace agreement in Aceh, but also in places like Nepal, Kenya, the Philippines, and also Tunisia, and many more. It is a powerful example of what non-state and civil society can do when they work together. And this image I came across in rebel-held Benghazi in late March of 2011. It's an image of the work of Quais, a 29-year-old Libyan artist who was shot by Gaddafi because of the danger of artistic ridicule and what it posed for a leader who exercised rule through fear. But instead of cowering the young people of Benghazi into submission, the next day dozens of them turned up at the rebel-held courtyard to paint the city afresh. 
It provides a graphic illustration of what the young people of Benghazi did in order to free themselves of a dictator. These are them. Now, today we hear about Libya as if it is simply a cauldron of Islamic fundamentalism and lawless disruption. But when I was there, the people I met were people like you and me. And all they were interested in doing was living under a state rule of law with human dignity and some chance at happiness. We are not Al-Qaeda. We want freedom, says the banner. That didn't happen because, as President Obama rightly observed, we failed, the UK and France failed, to build a sustainable peace with the Libyans because we relied upon a stabilization plan that did not address Libyan culture, failed to harness the power of civil society, rejected our call to enter into an inter-militia dialogue to try and build the rule of law before the conflict ended. So what are the lessons I have learned from these experiences? One is that governments do not own a monopoly over peacekeeping or peacemaking. Secondly, that it's society, not governments, that make peace and rebuild shattered societies. Thirdly, that if you want to understand and help a country, you have to understand its culture and people. Fourthly, that we knew a new concordat pact between government and non-state actors in which the role of civil society is recognized. And lastly, that in a full-spectrum approach to conflict resolution, we should include Scotland. Why Scotland? Why should peace delegations go to Northern Ireland but not our country? For it is an outward-looking country with a strong identity, with real traction amongst smaller nations and groups. Secondly, it has a phenomenal story to tell. Its constitutional journey provides a powerful template to those societies that want to transition to greater democracy. That is to say nothing of its all-inclusive politics or its gender-balanced uh, cabinet. If we look at the soft power institutions, the cultural festivals, it provides a perfect cultural background for cultural diplomacy. And even its countryside and castles can easily match those in Scandinavia. It has numerous elder statesmen who have real experience of the highest levels of multilateral diplomacy. So that's why in 2010, together with patrons from across the political divide, we set up Beyond Borders Scotland and have brought a number of delegations here to Scotland to learn the lessons that Scotland can give them. And also to our international festival at the Scottish Borders at Traquair House, where people each August come together to discuss the most pressing issues of our time. Just last month, a day after the general election here, all party leaders came together to welcome the UN Special Envoy to Syria and his Women Advisory Board to help them prepare for peace talks in Geneva. It is a graphic illustration of what can happen when we come together. Sponsored by the Scottish Government, with visa assistance from the FCO, it shows how Scotland can promote women peacemakers around the world. So I'm proud of that assistance. And in a sense, it ill behoves any policymaker who is serious about improving our record of peacemaking and peacekeeping, not to recognize the increasing power of small nations, the declining power of hard power, and that actually Scotland can play and its civil society can play 
a crucial role to make the UK a better force for good in the world. So I'm going to leave you, lastly, with one image of the white helmets of Aleppo that I have come across. Aleppo is, of course, a place of devastation and loss, but also of a thousand years of human ingenuity and diversity, in which ordinary people, like the white helmets, use disruptive thinking to try and protect their loved ones and their communities. So that is why I say to you today, whether you believe in independence or an enduring union, irrespective of that, let's join Scotland in putting on a white helmet to alleviate the suffering of others. For that is an obligation that falls upon all of us, all citizens, all nations of the United Kingdom, irrespective of what the constitutional makeup is said to be. Thank you very much.